So give your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 1. We'll be looking at some verses in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Acts. And while you're going there, you know me, I like to do reviews, so uh, we're going to do a quick review. But I, I ended up this past week, I reached out to a couple people I haven't seen for a while, and those are always awkward conversations. I feel like when I call them, it's like they feel like they're getting called by the principal. You know, where you been? So, uh, you know, it was nice to talk to a few people, but one of my good friends I hadn't seen for the last few weeks, I called, I said, where have you been? I miss you. And he, you know, he said these, these things have been going on here and there. And I said, well, you've been missing this great series on revival. You've got to come. He's like, well, I'll be here this week. I said, no, but you missed the last two weeks. He goes, not a problem, BJ. You always do a review at the beginning, so I'll get caught up anyway. <laughs> so as I told him, and I'll tell you guys, don't use my reviews as ways to miss on Sunday morning. Um, use it as a way to be caught up and um, a reminder of what we covered last week. So I want to do that. If you've, whether you've been here for the first time of this series, I've been here the whole time, we're talking on the issue of revival. And I talked um, the very first week, what prompted this was what has been happening or unfolding at Asbury College, and now we see on several other campuses across America where what is being referred to as a movement of the Holy Spirit or a revival, that God's doing awakening in our country. And in the opening sermon, what I did for us was lay a biblical foundation about revival. And I want to make sure that you guys are very clear how we approach issues, that whenever we want to know about what we believe and why we believe it, we're always going to go back to the Word of God. The Word of God lays the foundation for what we do. And so with that foundation, that very first week, I addressed four key questions. And the first one, what is revival? We then looked at, what, do we really need a revival today, which will be kind of the focal point of, of our sermon this morning. What are the characteristics of a true, genuine revival and also, how can I have a personal revival in my own life? And I threw those questions out there because I wanted to remind you that my initial motivation for this series was to educate you about revival. But we've come to realize that it's so much more about knowledge that you're gaining from this as it is about what God wants to do in your life right now and in our church as well. And so we took that foundation. And last week, I took you to a passage in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23. And there we saw that Israel was in a time of moral and spiritual decay. It was a very difficult time for the nation, and out of this time of moral and spiritual decay, God rose up a king, eight years old, by the name of Josiah. And we saw at a very young age, about 16 years old, God begins to move in his heart, and he begins to draw his people back to him. And what we saw through King Josiah was a true, genuine revival, a true spiritual wake in the life of the Jewish people. And as I've been going through this topic of revival, it made me think about my own life. You see, when I was younger, there was what was being called a movement of the Holy Spirit. The leadership of this church was talking about how God was moving a powerful way in their church. And as this was unfolding, people from all over the world would travel to this church to be part of this. And what the focal point of this movement of God or this revival, as they were calling it, was manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So what would happen at this church is the Holy Spirit would come upon people. They would begin to laugh and growl dance, shake, and bark like dogs. And so what I wanted to do when I was hearing all this and people were getting involved with it that I knew of, I wanted to go firsthand to see what was going on. And I'll tell you what, before I went, I had some severe reservations about what I heard. But I wanted to be honest with myself and with the Lord. And I said, Lord, I want to be open to what your spirit is doing. I don't want to come in with the wrong attitude or the wrong mindset. I want to be open to see what you're doing and never try to hinder when you're trying to move within your people. And so I went there with that prayer and with that attitude. But I'll tell you, the moment that I walked in, it was very clear. I was not witnessing a true, genuine revival. Now, how can I sit there and stay that? Because if you remember, we talked about and we saw in 2 Kings 22 and 23, there are characteristics of a true, genuine revival, a true movement of God's Spirit. And the first thing we saw was it'll include the preaching of God's Word. The second thing, there'll be the confession of sin. Thirdly, there'll be the transformation of lives. And we said lastly that revival always ends with passionate evangelism. And when I went to this place, to this church, I either these things that I'm talking about here were either minimized or they were completely absent. Now, while I was there, I did have a chance to talk with some of the people. There have been people there who have been part of that church for years, part of that revival, because the point, the point when I went, it had been going on for months. And the thing that I'll say in that time that I talked with people, there were some people there who truly had a desire for God. They had a longing, they had a, young, a hunger for God to take them to a deeper level of obedience and walking faithfully with Him. But there were also other people there that I had met, and they were more desirous to have an experience and to be part of the excitement of what was going on at that church. And when I meet people like that, 
like I did at this revival, who desire an experience of God more than God, it worries me. Do you see the point that I made? There's people out there, they desire an experience of God more than they desire God himself. And why it concerns me, because it makes me think of someone who's dealing with a, uh, like a physical addiction, like a drug addict. Many of you people may know people who are a drug addict. And what does a drug addict do every day? What does he live his life for? For his next high. And see, that's what I find with people. They often live their spiritual walk like a, like a drug addict, but it's what I call spiritual addiction. They're spending their whole lives waiting for that next spiritual high, never satisfied or content with where they're at. There's a friend of mine, actually it's an acquaintance of mine that's a relative, that's how their spiritual walk with Christ is lived. They're always depending or basing everything that they do off of their feelings or emotions. They're always seeking that next experience. And so the reality of their spiritual walk, it's like a roller coaster. They're up and down, constantly seeking some new vision, new dream, or new mystical phenomenon. And their faith in Jesus Christ, you know what's determined by? Their next spiritual experience. That's how they live their life. And I remember one time talking with her, and she was going through a tough time, and I just said, I know how you live out your faith, but I got a question for you. How much time do you spend in prayer and reading of your word? And she looked at me and she said, I don't do much of that at all. It's a sad reality to say that. Now, before I move on, many of you right now probably are thinking that you've got me kind of pegged where my views are. I'll simply say this. I believe clearly in the active role of the Holy Spirit. My upbringing was in a Pentecostal church where they would speak in tongues and do a lot of things like that. And while over the time my, my views have maybe changed, I will say that my time in that church growing up, I am so thankful for being reminded that if we do not have the Spirit active in our lives or in our church, we will do nothing that has an eternal value, that we need God's Spirit to move and, and to work in a powerful way. And I do understand two emotions. While my wife always hesitates or always jokes that I don't have any emotion, I do. There's times where we're worshiping the Lord and I, I just want to raise my hand and thank God for what He's done. When Jim Goner called me to tell me about how he was free of cancer, I mean, there was joy in that, in that conversation. So the emotions is part of our faith. And I don't want to stand here today and try to discount that. But I want you to understand is that we see what's these movements or revivals as they're being called. There'll be more that will happen uh, next year and the year after. As these unfold, we have got to do something very important. We have got to test everything by the Word of God. In fact, the Apostle John says it very well, a verse that you guys remember from our study of, uh, of the book of 1 John. He says this in 1 John 4.1. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. You see, one of the dangers that John was dealing with then that is happening today in the church is that we are accepting everything that we hear and see without evaluating it, without testing it. And as a result, John's advice to them is the same for us today, that we cannot falsely assume that everything we hear, every experience that we see is from God. We can't do that. Instead, we are to test any spiritual teaching or spiritual experience, not by our emotions or feelings, but by the Word of God. And I want you to keep that in mind, because as we get, begin to unpack what God did on Pentecost, you're going to find something very powerful, because Peter has this experience of the Holy Spirit with those involved. When that experience happens, guess what Peter does? He doesn't just say, wow, look at what we're doing. He says, let me take you to God's Word to show you why this is true. And so we must make sure that we are grounded in God's Word. But before we move any further, I want to come back to this question that we've been dealing with through our time on talking about revival. And that's the question, do I need God to awaken me? I want you to think about that question today as we go through this. Because what my job today is to take you to Acts 1 and 2 to see what God did in the church. And then in light of what he's done in the church, how do you answer that question, do I need God to awaken me today? Because what we're going to look at is how God moves in a powerful way as he begins to prepare the church for what he's called to do in the book of Acts. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 1 and just a quick historical context for that book. Jesus Christ has died. And three days later, we know from the, from the gospels, he rises from the grave. And after he rises from the grave, for 40 days, it tells us in the book of Acts, that he went out and began to appear to the disciples, which at this point, we'll call them apostles, because now they've experienced the resurrected Christ. So these disciples that now are apostles, they are now encountering Jesus Christ risen from the grave. And there's two reasons why Jesus appeared to them. Number one, he wanted them to know that he was physically, bodily resurrected. So he gave many convincing proofs that this is who I am. But secondly, he wanted to instruct them on what they were to do 
because he was going to ascend into heaven. And so in this context here, we pick up with verse 4 and 5 of chapter 1. It says the following, And while staying with them, referring to Jesus with the apostles, and really the Greek theirs means they're, they're hanging out, they're eating together, they're fellowshipping. And so while, they're, while he's staying with them, he, referring to Jesus, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus here is given a clear command, and that's what I love about Scripture. When Jesus gives a command, it's not like, you know, sometimes you look and say, did my mom and dad really mean that? Did my teacher really, they really didn't say that, did they? We have a way of interpreting things the way that we want. But when we go to Scripture, when God speaks, it's very clear. And here, Jesus is very clear. He gives a twofold command to his followers. He says the first one is this, do not depart from Jerusalem. What it really means in the Greek is literally, I can say it this way, stop departing from Jerusalem. So in other words, as they're in this time, they're going back and forth from the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus is like, look it, stop leaving the city. I want you to stay here and don't leave again. So that's the first command, don't depart from Jerusalem. The second command comes, he says, wait for the promise of the Father. So while you're in Jerusalem, you are to wait for the promise of the Father, which is something that if you guys on your own can read Luke 24, 49, Jesus made the same statement. This is what he said, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city, referring to Jerusalem, until you are clothed with power from on high. So in this twofold command that Jesus gives them, we find the very first way that God revives or awakens his church. You know what he does? It's through the promise of the Holy Spirit. And in that promise, we go to verse 5, Jesus begins to unpack what is that promise going to look like? Because Jesus says, you're going to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And that Greek word for baptize, you know what it means? It means to be immersed. And so they have a great picture. What he does, he said, just like John has baptized you, that John has immersed you with water, this Holy Spirit who's promised by my Father is going, you're going to be immersed with the Holy Spirit. So that's the imagery. This is where they're at. They're waiting for this immersion into the Holy Spirit. But while they're waiting, we all know what that moment can be like, right? Because sometimes we think the worst time in our lives is waiting for God to do something. I'm sure for them, they probably like, okay, you know, God, what are you doing? And we're ready for this promise to go. But I'm sure like all of them, you understand what it means to have moments of waiting, don't you? And perhaps right now, you're in a period of waiting. You're waiting for God to break through with a relationship. You're waiting for God to break through some physical need, through some spiritual need. And we so much want to rush out of that waiting period. But I'm going to tell you something that I've learned in my own life. That waiting period for God is some of the greatest moments you ever experience with Him. Because it's in that moment as you're waiting for Him, He is refining, shaping, preparing you to do what He's called you to do. And what we see here is very clear. That as they're waiting for God, we'll see in that waiting period, He is preparing them for the greatest breakthrough that the church will ever experience, which is this promise of the Father. Because what I have learned in my own life as I've waited upon the Lord, I have recognized how weak I am, but how strong He is. There's a verse that I know many of you probably know by heart here. And if you don't, I pray that you memorize it. But it's Isaiah 40, 31. And it was the nation of Israel as they were facing enemies coming against and all these challenges. This is what the prophet Isaiah says. He says, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So I'm telling you today, if you're in a day and a period of waiting for the Lord, Allow this time for you to allow God to strengthen you for what he's called you to do. So we go back to our passage. And what was the purpose then? Why do these people need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit? What would be the reason for this? Well, we find out in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And verse 8 is a verse that if you've never know it by heart, you've probably heard it before. Because for many people, it's their theme verse. And in fact, it's the theme verse for the book of Acts. And this is what it says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So in this verse, the purpose or reason why they're going to be baptized by the Holy Spirit is for what? For the word power. That Greek word for power is the, is the word dunamis, where we get the English word dynamite. And it can also be translated ability. So what it's saying here is that I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to give you power. Power. 
And this is the second way that God revives His church. It's not just through the promise of the Holy Spirit. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Specifically, what is the power of this Holy Spirit going to do for us? What ability is He going to give us? What does it say in verse 8? To go out there and boldly proclaim the truth of who Jesus Christ is, to be His witnesses to all the world. And as you go through the book of Acts, and I ask you to read it on your own, what do you see in the book of Acts? That as the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they boldly go out and share the gospel to whoever comes across their path. In fact, the final verse of the book of Acts, if you've ever read the final chapter, kind of ends very abruptly. Paul's in prison in Rome, most likely a house prison, because he can have guests come and go. But this is what it says in Acts 28, 31. It says, here's Paul. He is proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So here comes the Holy Spirit to empower them to witness. And the whole story of the book of Acts of the early church is about one main thing, which is what? Go and preach the message. And just so we don't think that this message is not for us, it is for us. We are called, just like the apostles, to go out and preach the gospel. It's something that many of you here have been in church longer than I have. And you can probably remember when I was younger too, Sunday school class, right? That Sunday school teacher would walk up, and no matter what passage she was in the Bible, she always left you with three things. First thing is pray. Second thing, read your Bible. And third, go out and preach the gospel. Go out and share your faith with other people. And we have to understand right here, the early church, that was one of the primary responsibilities that God gave them to go out and witness, and it's one of our primary responsibilities as well. In fact, it's our task to continue to carry on what was passed on to the apostles to be an extension of what happened in the book of Acts. I almost think the Holy Spirit ended it that way, with Paul in prison preaching the gospel because it's like the statement saying, and by the way, the story's not done because now you take over. The mantle's been passed to you. Are you going to do what they started to do for me? And I think it's so powerful because here's the beauty of this. Just like them having the power of the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit's power is available to us today to go out and share this message. And please understand, when we think about the power of the Holy Spirit, what do we often think about? Boldness to proclaim, right? And were they bold to proclaim? They were bold to proclaim the message. And in fact, all of them but, but uh, John the Apostle gave their lives as a martyr for the gospel. But I want you to understand, the power of the Holy Spirit is more than having boldness to proclaim. Because we all need boldness, right? Because I'm sure there's people in your life right now, could be a co-worker, could be a, a friend, a family member, that you're just like, man, I know i got to share the gospel. They need it, but... I'm just so afraid what they're going to say to me. It could ruin a relationship. They never want to speak to me again. So we all need that boldness to proclaim. But I want you to understand that the power of the Holy Spirit is more than just having boldness. It is having the confidence or the encouragement that what you're going to share has the power to transform lives. And the reason is this. Because salvation is not a work that you and I do. It's not a human effort. I can't give you five steps about how to go out and evangelize and get results that you want. But if you want to see eternal results in your evangelism, then you know what you do? You rely upon the Holy Spirit. Because it is only the Holy Spirit that can awaken a person who is dead in their sin and bring life to them in Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what's going on here. God says, I'll give you my power to preach boldly, but I'll give you that power that you'll see me work with the truth of the gospel message and I will transform lives through it. And that should be an encouragement to us today because so for so many of us, fear dominates us in preaching the gospel. We're so afraid. What if I say this? And what if it's wrong? How, how do I go about saying that? And I'm not saying that there's, there's ways, right or wrong ways to do it, but I'm simply going to say this, that we should never have an excuse to share the gospel with other people. Because if today you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then the same Holy Spirit who gave them power to preach it has given you power as well. And that is that boldness and that affirmation that the truth of that gospel can transform lives. You may look at me and say, come on, man. Are you sure? Yeah. The Apostle Paul knew this very well. First of all, how did he get transformed? By the power of the Holy Spirit. A man who persecuted Christians, and now he became a proclaimer of it. But Paul had to write to the Corinthian church. It was a difficult church. And I can't blame them for being a difficult church, because they're in a difficult city. Corinth was a modern-day, or an ancient-day Las Vegas Rampant sin, forms of all forms of idol worship. So Paul's got to write two letters to them to correct them. And some scholars say there's a third letter they call the severe letter that we don't have access to. So here's him trying to address all this. And so to this church that has difficult people from people of different lifestyles, Paul reminds them, when I came and I preached to you, you don't forget how I came to you. And I want you to hear this right now. 
Because this is countercultural to how we share the gospel today. Because what would happen is if I was up here to tell you to share the gospel, I would say, this is what you do. Make it very friendly. Don't offend. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about judgment. Just simply, simple thing like, you know, Jesus loves you. Got a great plan for your life. Let's make it very simple so they're going to want to hear it. We'll make it palatable. We'll make it appealing to them, right? But that's not what Paul did when he went to Corinth. I want you to hear these words. This is 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verses 4 and 5. He says, my message and my preaching were very plain. Nothing exciting about it. But he says this, rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. That's one of my favorite verses. Because it is a constant reminder to me as a pastor. That as much as I want to throw out some motivational conversation to you because you'll like me better, right? I realize that there will be never any eternal fruit from my preaching or from this church if I don't rely upon His Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. There are people sitting here today. Some of you have seen breakthroughs in your life. Some of you have walked from darkness into light because you heard the Word of God preached and the Spirit took that message and He transformed your life. And Paul is so very aware of this. He realizes to this church where if you go through Corinthians, they came from all these lifestyles that our world right now is saying that it's okay to walk that way. Paul's like, you know what? You may think that you're bound by that sin, but I've watched God set people free because of the power of the gospel in their lives and the Spirit bringing them them away from that lifestyle into a life with Christ. So here we see this power of the Holy Spirit to embolden us to go preach the gospel. But I want to move on back in Acts chapter 1 because they're still in this waiting period. We've got the presence of the Holy Spirit. We've got the promise, or excuse me, the promise of the Holy Spirit. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit, but they're still waiting for it to be fulfilled. So what happens in verses 12 through 14 of Acts chapter 1, that as they're waiting for the Holy Spirit, for this power to come upon them to preach this message, they spend that time in prayer. So what it says in verse 14, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. This is a very, I'm telling you, powerful for you to hear this. Because as you have those moments of waiting, as you're, as, you're, as you're looking for God to move you forward, spend that time on your knees before Him in prayer. Because one of the things that I've seen in my own life and other people's lives, that some of the greatest breakthroughs that we ever see in our lives comes in response to prayer. Now, I'm not here to tell you that if you pray, it, you're going to get it. It's not this name and acclaiming kind of stuff, okay? But what I'm telling you is this, that God wants to respond to the faithful prayers of His children. And it may not be in the way you want or the timing that you want, but I'm telling you, I've seen God do major breakthroughs when people at one moment in their life say, for the next few days, I'm going to seek God like I've never sought Him before on my knees in prayer. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, whenever God determines to do a great work, He first sets His people to pray. And maybe that's the challenge for you today. Maybe you're saying, God, I need a breakthrough. And God is saying, do you not know that? Just get on your knees and cry out to me. Because there's another quote I wanted to share by Charles Spurgeon. And I didn't, but I'm going to share it anyway. And this is what he said. He said, if you want to see a church get awakened, people in the church transformed, he goes, you want to know when God's really working? It's not what you see on a Sunday morning. You know what it is? When you see people coming and flocking to those prayer meetings. You see, as much as I'm grateful that we've been able to fill three services, and I rejoice in that, you've come here to preach the word, I tell you, one of the greatest times of power in this church is Friday afternoon, once a month, we have a time of prayer. And I pray that one of these days that everyone will come and we'll have this church so packed out that people will be standing outside praying. Because the thing that I know and the God that I serve, He is a God who faithfully responds to the prayers of His people. And when we begin to pray, I'm going to tell you something, an awakening will happen in this church. And it won't just happen in the lives that are here. You want to know when we see that awakening? When God starts to transform you and draw you to Him, but also you go out in the power of the Holy Spirit, and you begin to share the gospel to people that would never walk in this church, that would never come hear what Pastor BJ has to say, but because God has put you in their life, you become a light, you become a testimony. And all of a sudden, because of your influence, they start walking through these doors to hear the gospel message and to get saved. It's what happens when God awakens His church. We can't forget the power of the Holy Spirit and how that needs to be accompanied with prayer. So with all that said, let's go to chapter 2. Because now we're going to see the promise of the Holy Spirit be fulfilled. This is what it says in the first four verses. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here's the third way that God revives His church. You want to know how it is? Through the presence of the Holy Spirit. So we've already seen the promise of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Now here in Acts chapter 2, the third way that God revives or awakens His church is through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now I could spend months talking about this passage. And I'm sure all of you guys are eager to see where I'm going to go with this, aren't you? But I'll simply say for the sake of time, I can only focus on a few things today. The first thing I want to talk about is the fact that this occurred on the day of Pentecost. Because you're going to find out that God didn't just choose a random date to have the Holy Spirit come. There was a specific reason why God sent, them on, or sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Because Pentecost was really, it's a Greek name for the Jewish festival known in the Old Testament as the Feast of Weeks. And on your own, when you get a chance, go to Leviticus chapter 23, that, ver- that book of the Bible you always like to read about, right? So go there and read about the Feast of Weeks. And you'll find that this Feast of Weeks was a festival that celebrated the gathering of the first fruits of the harvest of God. So in an agricultural society, when the harvest would come, you know what they would do? They would take the very first fruits of their, of their uh, crop and they'd go before God and say, God, we give this to you as a blessing, as a thankfulness, as an attitude of heart, a great, a heart of gratitude for all that you've done for us. And see, in that same way, it was on this day where God sent the Holy Spirit. And guess what the Holy Spirit did? He empowered those people to share the gospel. And guess what the result of that was? The first fruits of the church. What a, what a way that God is bringing this together. Just like on that day they celebrate the first fruits to God, God says, I'm going to empower you to bring the first fruits back to me for this church. And you read the passage. 3,000 people gave their lives to the Lord on the day of Pentecost. The second thing I want to talk about here, besides the day it occurred, is that it was also a supernatural act of God. We have to be very clear. This is not something that's happened on a human level. That somehow... You know, human emotions just getting roused up. This is a supernatural act of God. And so when we're talking about supernatural acts of God, we can't always fully explain it in our English, in our modern day language, can we? And so what they use is they use language to explain what went on. And so how does he explain it? It was the sound of a mighty wind. It was tongues of fire above their head. You often see fire represented with God's presence throughout the Old Testament. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Now, I can't hear to this morning satisfy your curiosity about tongues completely, but I will at least speak to it from our passage here in Acts chapter 2. What does it mean that they spoke in other tongues? Well, I'm going to give you my opinion on this, and we'll go to Scripture to back it up. What was going on as the Holy Spirit came upon them? They began to speak in a language they did not know, but it was a language that was spoken by other people. And I'll explain that to you. This is what it says in verse 5 through 8. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. See, all these people from across the Roman Empire, they came to Jerusalem to be part of this worship, part of this festival, should I say. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered. So they hear these people up in this upper room, and stuff's going on. So they're kind of like, what, what, what's going on? So this is what they say, because each one was what? Hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Can you imagine that you, I guess the way I would look, well, first of all, let me just tell you, the Greek word for language there is dialectos. We get the word dialect. So it refers to the language of a nation or a region. So in this context here, these people have come from all over the Roman Empire. And as they've come, they see these Galileans speaking their dialect, speaking their language. And they're like, how do these men know our language? And so this confusion begins to, begins to come, what in the world's going on here? A modern day example would be if you're on the mission field and you're now commun- trying to communicate the gospel to someone in a different language that they don't know that language, that all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes upon you and gives you the ability for, to communicate to them in a way that they can understand. Now, how does this go on? I don't know. I share with the previous two services that to fully understand what's happening here would be like you and I walking outside after a rainy day. And as the rain stops, the beautiful rainbow comes up, Right? And we're all admiring the rainbow and looking at the colors. And all of a sudden, a person comes by and says, what are you guys admiring? And you begin to describe to them what the rainbow looks like. But then unbeknownst to you, as you look over to them, you realize they're blind. In fact, there's a person who's never seen anything in the day in their life. And just as much as you are limited to fully explain that rainbow to them, we cannot always fully understand the supernatural works of God. But what I would say, from my opinion, what's going on here 
is that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, either they are speaking a language these people knew that they didn't know, but God gave them the ability to communicate that, or they're speaking in their own language, and as they're speaking that language, the Holy Spirit enables that language to be what? Translated into their own language. God's doing something, but what we know what he's doing, what is the purpose of this? It goes back to verse 8 of chapter 1, that the Holy Spirit could give them power to do what? To boldly proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ, to be his witnesses, to tell others about, what, about who Jesus is and what he has done. And here we see the fulfillment of that, that God has empowered them by the Holy Spirit to communicate this message to other people. And in fact, as you go in verse 11 and 12, this is what it says. And we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? You know, you guys may be a little bit confused about this, and I understand. But we need to, under, to grasp the importance of this for our own lives. You see, I was sharing earlier that we were in Haiti, and we had gone to this hospital in Haiti, and it was so sad to go there. There was little kids that were laying on the floor. They had bugs all over them, and just terrible diseases. There was not an adequate you know, medical staff there. So we were talking to the one doctor about what, what these kids were facing, what do they need. And so he starts speaking Creole. Now, unless you speak Creole, I do not. We had a very big problem with our language, didn't we? And so as he begins to start, and he's realizing that we don't know what he's saying and, and vice versa, he, re, he starts to speak in Spanish. And so my mother elbows me and says, BJ, didn't you take two years of high school Spanish? Speak to him. Now, I took two years of high school Spanish, but I can only tell you how to get to the bathroom. <laughs> Beyond that, I can't do anything. But see, that would be where the Holy Spirit comes. But see, even though we had his language barrier, you know what ended up happening? We ended up, we're able to communicate effectively. And see, that's what happens to all of us. Have you ever gone out and shared the gospel to someone? And you're all excited and there's enthusiasm, but you walk, you come home and you tell your friend or your loved one, like I was talking to a wall. It's like they didn't want to hear anything. Everything I was saying was like I was speaking another language. And you get discouraged. You're like, God, you know, I've seen you transform my life. I see the power and love of Jesus Christ. How could someone not want to hear that message? And why is it that when I go to some people, they're just like a wall that look at me and there's like no reaction. But then all of a sudden, someone comes across your path. Maybe you weren't even preparing for it. And you begin to share with them about Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, this, this changes in their face. They begin to start crying and saying, I, I want to know more about Christ. I want to come to know who he is. And see, in that moment there, you know what? The Holy Spirit has been doing his work because the Holy Spirit, what does it do whenever we communicate the message? It begins to take a heart that is darkened and hardened to sin and begins to open up to the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Every day we see the power of the Holy Spirit doing that. So even though there's limitations on a fact that we don't know, always know everyone's language, and even though there's spiritual limitations, the Holy Spirit can override that and take the truth of what we're sharing and bring a transformed life out of it. It's the power of what we see here and the boldness that we can gain from the Holy Spirit and we see Him doing the work that we cannot do. So when we go back to chapter 2, and now we've seen the presence and the, or excuse me, the promise, the power in the, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, to the rest of chapter 2, which covers verse 14 through 39, Peter begins to explain to them what's going on. Because you remember, what was the crowd's response? As they're speaking in their own languages, they said, these people got to be drunk. And Peter says, no, it's the middle of the day, we're not drunk. Notice does he say they're not drunk? What does Peter do? How does Peter validate that experience of what is happening in that upper room? He goes back to the word of God. He begins to specifically quote the prophet Joel about how God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And it's such an important thing because I'm going to tell you something. We're going to see more movements of God and more revivals. And I put those with quotes because I'm not here to say what is or was not outside of what we've talked about. But I'll simply say this, that if you're going to be able to test those effectively, like John says, here's Peter gives us one of the greatest tests for how we can know if something's of God. And here's what it is. Peter shows us that Scripture should interpret our experience. And experience should not interpret Scripture. Do you hear what I'm saying? So the next time you see an experience or someone claiming something... Does the word of God validate that? Because our experience is never the foundation for our faith. The word of God is. Now once Peter lays out the biblical justification for what was going on, he then begins to share the gospel. And the gospel is very clear. What does he do? Hey, have a good, God wants to give you your best life. No, what does Peter do? He calls them to repent of their sin and to believe in Jesus Christ. The very thing that God said would happen when the Holy Spirit came. 
that was promised by the Father. Now, before we move on, I want to make this little side point. Who is the one here that is preaching the very first message? Peter. You guys know how much I like Peter, right? Because we're all Peters. We all have had those moments like Peter where we've denied Jesus Christ, right? You think about that the whole time. Here's Jesus. He is arrested by the Roman soldiers, right? And he's taken before the high priest. And during that whole event when Jesus is left all alone, and of course, Peter beforehand was boldly saying, I'll never depart from you, Jesus. For three different times he was asked, do you know Jesus? And what did Peter do? Three times he denied him. And all of us here can relate to Peter, can't we? We've had those moments in our lives. We've walked away and we've denied him. And this is the power. The very one that denied that he knew Jesus Christ. What do we see here? The power of God's forgiveness, but also the power of God restoring and using him again. And right now, maybe you're walking through a season of being like Peter and you're saying, how could God ever forgive me? How could God ever use me? Peter's a reminder that no matter what your past may have done, or what you have done in your past, that this very moment right now, forgiveness is available to you, and not only forgiveness, but God can raise you up and restore you and use you in a powerful way. Don't be like other people who let their past hinder them from what they can do for God. Be like Peter and surrender your life and say, God, use me any way that you want. And so we go to verse 40 through 47. And under the power of the Holy Spirit, the church begins to grow. In fact, this is what it says about the church in verse 47. And it says, The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So this is what we see, this idea of of the promise of the Holy Spirit, them waiting upon it, then being empowered of of the Holy Spirit, and then the presence of the Holy Spirit living within them. And before I go to my closing challenge, I want to make a very important point. Because many of you might say, why do we really need Pentecost? What was the purpose of this? I thought God's Spirit was always available, right? But see, you go back to the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament and up to Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, listen, would only come upon certain individuals for a certain amount of time for a certain task. I'll give you an example. David, we all think about King David, right? We all think David anointed by the Holy Spirit, but do you know that didn't happen until he was anointed by Saul first? When Saul anno- excuse me, when Samuel anointed David as king, it's when the Holy Spirit came upon him. This is what it says in 1 Samuel 16. Uh, Verse 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. You see, throughout Scripture, we see the Holy Spirit coming upon certain individuals and remaining on them until they finish the task that God has called them to do. But do you see the radical change now because of Pentecost? Because now it's not just individuals that can access the Holy Spirit. Now it is available to all believers in Jesus Christ. From the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit lives within you and within me. In other words, the very presence of the Holy Spirit is with us every moment of our lives. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. He says, For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we are all made to drink of one spirit. What does he say here? Does he say a few people? Only some who get this and others who don't? He says, all of you have been baptized. We've all been baptized into one body. That means as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are united because of why? Because with the day we gave our life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came into our lives and now dwells within us and we are united together because of that experience. It is something that we all gain, that we all have access to. And so the closing challenge is this. I'm going to go back to that central question. Do I need God to awaken me? I want to pause and just have you think about that. And all that I've shared today in the last two weeks, do you need God to awaken you today? I'm not going to quiz you today and say, raise your hand, yes or no. But I want you to think about that. Because if I, I'll give you my opinion. I believe, yes, there are times where we need to be awakened, refreshed and filled by the Holy Spirit. Paul says it in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why would I say that? And all that I've just talked about, why would, I need, why would we need to be refreshed or be filled with the Spirit? Because we all live in a fallen world. In a fallen world, there are moments in lives we all know we go through discouragement, don't we? We go through the discouragement of dealing with health issues, of broken relationships, of emotional pain, of mental and physical pain, whatever it may be. And during those moments, it's so easy for us to begin to doubt, to begin to see our faith weakened. And there's times in those moments of discouragement we just say, God, I need to be refreshed. I need to be filled with you again. 
But beyond that, how about the times we feel disconnected to God? Times where we know what we are called to do, but in disobedience and sin, we walk away from God. Something that David himself experienced. Because in Psalm 51, what does he say? He says, Lord, restore the joy of my salvation. He understood that that disconnect with God. So we all understand that. And so the fact that we live in a fallen world, and even though we're saved and the Holy Spirit lives within us, there are times where we need to be awakened or filled again by the Spirit. Now I'm going to qualify this. This is a very important point that you don't miss out on. What I'm saying by being filled with the Spirit is this. We are not being filled with what we do not already possess. Did you hear what I said? We're not being filled with what we do not already possess. You see, because of that promise, that power and presence of the Holy Spirit, the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you've been fully equipped to walk in victory. In fact, you're not lacking anything right now. You don't need another experience. You don't need another phenomenon out there. You don't need to go off to some place that's hundreds of miles away to somehow feel like i got to be refreshed. The very moment right here, because the Holy Spirit lives within you, is simply to say, God, before you, I want you to awaken and refresh and fill me with your spirit. And you have access to that because he's already there. Peter himself says this, the one who gave this message at Pentecost. This is what it says in 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4. He says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for godly living. In other words, everything that you need to live in a life that is right and honoring to Christ has already been given to you. We have received all this by coming to know him, referring to Jesus, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption by human desire. In other words, not only do we have the power in us to live a godly life, but that power is there for us to walk in victory in this life until Christ comes back. So I want you to understand that promise, that presence and power of the Spirit of God is available to all people. All of us here are available. All it requires is this, that you come to the cross of Jesus Christ, you repent of your sin, and you ask Him to forgive you. And the moment that you do that, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit dwells within you. And he guarantees you two things, that you are God's possession, but that you have eternal life because of what Christ has done for you. Paul says it very well, and this is our last verse of the day. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. He says, when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee. Some translations say it's a seal. And so just think about you're sending a letter in the ancient times. You put your personal seal in that letter. What does that mean? That it means that it's under your authority. You own that. So what he's saying here is the Spirit is God's guarantee. God's seal of what? That he will give us the inheritance he promised. And that he has purchased us to be his own people. And he did this so we would praise and glorify him. You see, as I go to prayer today, there's really two things I want to say. First of all, If you've come to the cross today and you've given your life to Jesus Christ, then you need to start walking in the power that is available to you through the Holy Spirit. And if today you need to be filled, then you get on your knees and you seek God in forgiveness and say, God, today, fill me to do what you've called me to do. Because you're lacking nothing that you need to do what God has called you to do. It's already available. But today, if you've not come to the cross, today is the day. To come and ask Jesus to forgive you in that very moment when you ask for forgiveness, the Holy Spirit dwells within you and it confirms what Jesus Christ did for you that not only you are God's child, but you have eternal life because of the cross of Jesus Christ. This is my final prayer as we go. I pray that we can all, like Paul says there, we can all in this room, before we walk out of this room, we can all praise and glorify God today. Why? Because we have that guarantee by the Holy Spirit. That guarantee not just in the present, that as I go through the difficult times of life, that, I'm ever, that I have His presence. That's not it. It's just not just for the present, but I have that guarantee from the Holy Spirit, not just right now, but also for my future, that it is secure in the hands of God. So let me ask you today, do you have that guarantee and assurance? Do you know right now that no matter what you go through, God has equipped you with everything you need to walk in victory? But secondly, do you know that the moment that you take your final breath, do you have that guarantee by the Holy Spirit that you know where you're going to go, that your future is secure in the hands of God himself? I pray that you do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.